Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Francine Lacqua from Bloomberg TV, and we're talking about a very important subject. So thank you to our live audience, and of course, the, those joining us from home or from the workplace. Now, increasing female workforce participation and representation and leadership in both business, but also government, are two key levers for not only improving economic gender parity, but also generating greater dynamism and resilience for the economies. Now, it wouldn't be the World Economic Forum if they didn't have also data points to actually show you exactly what's been happening. A global gender gap report has found a gradual but steady increase in the share of women in leadership roles. And this is something that we can applaud, but it stood at 36.9% in 2022. And for the first time, there is at least one woman in every parliament in the world. These developments provide important momentum to build on, but frankly, they're just not enough. The current environment calls for a pragmatic approach, which is what we're going to try and do here, pragmatic, and focusing on leadership, key levers that companies can influence beyond representation. So actually onto decision making is something that we want to focus on. Government policy can be designed to increase labor force participation, productivity, wages. So we'll talk about the economy, financial and technology access, improved care provisions, and representation of public sector leadership. So all of that in just 45 minutes. And we're also expecting questions from the audience. It is my great pleasure to have here an expert panel. Sue Duke will kick us off to explain some of the things that she's been looking at at LinkedIn, head of global public policy and economic graph team. Paul Donovan, chief economist at UBS Global Wealth Management. And he's also written a brilliant book actually on um, gender inequality and things that need to change. Lady Mariam Jame, of course, one of the leading important 
you know, people that we've been listening to in terms of founder and chief executive officer, I am the code from the UK, and then Maha Al Ali uh, on you know, Jordan's national gender parity strategy. And she's, of course, Secretary General, Jordanian National Commission for Women. So thank you all for joining us. So maybe kick us off and see what you're seeing. So you have, first of all, a, an exciting report on equality in the workplace, but a lot, we've gone through so many shifts in the last three to four years. Yeah. What can you tell us that, you know, that, that you've seen that maybe a lot of people here wouldn't have seen? So look, what's very clear is that we have seen labour markets go through enormous disruption over the past number of years, most obviously the pandemic and the economic upheaval that that brought. And what's just as clear is that things are not going to settle down anytime soon. And what we've learned from these cycles is that when there are these big systemic shocks, health, economic and other shocks, it's women who take the biggest hit. WEF's own Global Gender Gap report showed the pandemic pushing gender parity back a full generation, and we saw the exact same trends on LinkedIn. At the onset of the pandemic, we saw on LinkedIn women taking a disproportionate hit when it came to layoffs and hiring in general, but also when it came to leadership specifically. The proportion of women being hired into leadership roles during that period went backwards, and in some sectors, we saw two, three years of progress being undone, and we went right back to where we were in 2018. And when we look ahead to the big drivers of change and disruption that are coming our way, those twin transitions of digital and of green, women are already on the back foot and could be set up to lose out on those transitions again. We have long spoken about the digital gender gap. And when we look at what looks to be the biggest digital disruptor that's coming down the tracks, AI, there we're not in a good spot again. Women hold less than one third, just 30% of AI roles around the world. And when it comes to green, for every 10 men who are considered green talent on our platform, we only have six women. So even when we get out the other side of this uncertain economic cycle, women are not set up to take advantage of this next wave of disruption um, that's headed to our labour markets. And so I can't even, you know, I can't believe I'm still asking this, but there's a direct link between diversity and economic performance, and yep. you can see it in the numbers. And I, I think what is particularly important is that we're embarking on you know, the fourth industrial revolution, automation, AI, and all that good stuff. Um, but what actually matters in the next 20 years is, is not the technology. I don't care about technology. I'd still be using a BlackBerry if I was allowed. Um, <laughs> what matters is how we use the technology, which means it's right person, right job, right time. No, right person. We're not being gender specific here. And the risk is that if you don't have an inclusive workforce, you're just throwing away the talent that could otherwise lead to enormous benefits. And if you don't have a diverse workforce, you are not considering every possible aspect of the enormous change that's coming through. And the whole point about this change is it's so disruptive, you need to have a very broad approach to understanding it. If your board is entirely comprised of white Anglo-Saxon middle-aged bald men, not a demographic I am opposed to, quite obviously, but if that's all you've got, you've got a monoculture of thinking and you're basically guaranteed to fail. So we need both the inclusion and the diversity and gender, of course, is, is the big one here that, that we need to, to get right and we're still not getting it right. Um, you know, economics profession, not least of all, which is why I'm the token man on the panel. So we, we really need to... I think be breaking down the barriers. I would add a, perhaps a note of optimism to, to Sue's comments because I think there is so much social disruption coming that maybe it's sort of like tearing up the rule book that, you know, fathers are spending more time at home with their kids and maybe that changes childcare. The fact that commuting is not entirely optional, but becoming more optional. I mean, 44% of UK people work from home at least part of the time that perhaps starts to challenge some of these uh, traditional assumptions and within a very stereotyped world, we may actually be able to make some progress. So, you know, let's cling to the optimism. Okay, and we'll get back to that. Mahal Ali, can you talk to us a little bit about Jordan's 
um, national gender parity strategy and how it started and how it's going. Yes, building on what uh, Sue and Paul explained, uh, it's obvious that it is important to have in place policies, strategies, legislations that would support uh, enhancing the participation of women in the economy as well as in, in uh, leadership positions. Um, and in order to have this, we need also uh, uh, to have a supporting uh, business environment uh, where we can see gender mainstreaming in institutions, uh, including both the private as well as the public sector. And then we have another factor which is related to the culture and the uh, uh, social norms uh, in the country. And I think this is an issue not only matters to Jordan, but matters to all countries that need to be worked on to have a positive uh, 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 social norms and, and cultural uh, beliefs and, and principles that would support the empowerment of women. So uh, having all this in mind, in Jordan we have uh, uh, put in place a national strategy for uh, women. Uh, this was endorsed by the government back in 2020 and uh, in parallel to this national strategy we have been, uh, uh, we had lots of dynamics in the country in terms of modernization uh, that covered three important paths uh, uh, economic, political, as well as public sector uh, uh, modernization led by His Majesty the King. And uh, to focus more on the economic, um, based on that, a strategy was also launched uh, that focuses on six uh, initiatives that aim at increasing women's participation in Jordan uh, in the economy uh, to, uh, to actually to double the uh, uh, participation from 14% to 28% percent in the coming 10 years. This, of course, uh, requires lots of collaboration and joint work uh, from different stakeholders, uh, including the government, the private sector, the social, uh, the uh, civil society also. And um, we've uh, worked on this to develop an action plan to implement the National Women's Strategy with a number of initiatives and projects that are uh, uh, connected to around 70 implementing partners. Uh, so this gives also or indicates the, the, uh, how comprehensive the national strategy is uh, and this brings me to a point that in order to address the issue of economic participation of women we need to holistically address this issue. So it needs strategies, it needs legislation, it needs uh, uh, to work on the culture, we need to work on the education, uh, we need to work on the humanitarian rights of women, access to finance, transportation, it's, it's all interconnected. And maybe I will uh, uh, end by uh, a very uh, uh, useful and fruitful collaboration that uh, Jordan had with the World Economic Forum uh, in the form of an initiative to establish uh, or to form uh, an accelerator for uh, closing the gender gap. And this is also an example of collaboration between, a successful example of collaboration between the, the government and the private sector and civil society to develop in place and put in place a plan and a number of actions that also uh, focus on empowering women uh, in the economic field. And Lady Jamit, you work basically on these structures, right, to make sure that there's more access to education than access to the, the labor workforce. What works? I think what, what works is the, uh, the I am the Court has now become a lighthouse here at the World Economic Forum. It's the time we took to fix things. Um, and when you're looking at gender equality at the moment and gender parity, we have forgotten so many young women and girls. You know, I was a young girl growing up in Senegal. I'm now sitting here next to you. So we are forgetting time and that women actually, you know, we need to invest in them, not see them as a charity, but we need to invest in women if we want them to have a position of leadership. That's one thing we don't, I am the code. But also we gave ourselves a very clear goal and mission. And I think uh, data speaks itself. I'm a, I, my, my, my other hat I wear is I'm a data freak, you know. <laughs> I love data because data show evidence and accountability. Where we have one million women and girls, we learn how to code by the year 2030. And so these are young women in refugee camps, in slums, in favelas of Brazil. These are women that we have left behind. And I think to talk about gender equality, we need to look after the have and the have not. But also the private sector must see these young women as an investment, not as a charity. And also bring mentorship and sponsorship. You know, we've been very lucky to have uh, Skillsoft who are here, but also UBS. UBS, have, they've been the first organization to fund our organization. Funding is needed um, to run the programs we're running. 
In Kakuma refugee camp alone today, we have 7,000 young women who are refugees in Kenya. And Kenya gives the land to refugees, but they're not practitioners. And so young women, they're the first young women in the world who are learning how to code basic fundamentals of coding. So if you want to talk about AI, machine learning, big data in the next, in the next eight years, you have to include these women. And I think finally, we need to create a women-friendly culture. Uh, you know, not just, uh, you know, feeling sorry for women, but actually really empowering women economically. Like in Senegal, my country, the Minister of Finance is a, you know, is, she's a woman who, who's empowered through business. So she knows how to empower another woman. When you empower a young woman, give her money. And I really believe coding, uh, for all the economists in the room, let's start making coding compulsory in every single country in the world, but also linking coding in the GDP of your country. Because my young girls in Kakuma, they will ask $30,000 or $40,000 per year in 2030. So if you don't invest in them now, you will not hire them <laughs> in 2030. <laughs> Can I have a quick poll actually of the panel? Who thinks, and Paul was mentioning this, that if you're working from home because of the pandemic, maybe it makes it easier to do your job as you know, female, and that leads to more diversity. But it's unclear what happens to promotions and also what happens in other parts of the world. Are you optimistic that actually flexible working or, you know, coding from abroad makes, you know, equals the level playing field. So I am, like Paul, very optimistic, but we should be very clear here that this is not going to happen accidentally. We need to stay very focused and very intentional about this. And we have seen over the past number of years that progress is not always linear. Sometimes we go backwards. We went backwards during the pandemic and we've gone backwards when these shocks have hit me before. But flexibility is one of those areas that Paul touched on that really has the potential to be a game changer. This was the number one lesson out of the pandemic. Women want and need the flexibility to be able to juggle their personal and professional responsibilities. We see that on our planet. Platform, we see that women are much more likely to apply to remote roles compared to men, but it is crucially important that flexible working is normalized for all workers, not just women, if we're going to break this double shift of caregiving and of working that women often face. Are, are you confident, Paul, that this leads to quality jobs? Actually. So I think that it can, because it's it's not just about, oh well, I'm I'm working flexibly. It's also about how companies have to adapt in a more flexible working environment. It breaks down, literally breaks the old boy network. Because you know, you're not going out for drinks with your all male buddies after work because you've got more flexible working. It requires you to think more objectively about actually measuring output, not who you get on with at the coffee machine. Mm. Uh, so the unconscious bias, which is a huge problem for all of us, um, we, we sort of erode. And the other thing I think is that it enables um, portfolios of income. And this is something which did actually come through in the pandemic, where in many, many countries we get this absolute explosion of business startups. And these are very small scale, one person business startups, a lot of them seem to be retail. And, of course, no one's setting up a, a bricks and mortar retail business in the midst of the pandemic. You're, you're going out and you're selling you know, whatever it is you're, you're making on um, Amazon Marketplace or whatever. And it does seem that women were also part of that, and that's the entrepreneurship. Now, I appreciate you know, the funding of women uh, in business is a, is a huge problem. If you have a female entrepreneur and a male entrepreneur and they seem the same, always back the female entrepreneur because she's had to work three times as hard to get to that stage. But that is starting to be eroded with perhaps less need for capital, better startups. So long story short, yes, I think that we are making the changes and it is genuine quality jobs, but also quality entrepreneurship that can come out of this process. But as Sue said, you know, it's not something passive. We've actually got to work for this. Yeah, and Maha, given the blueprint that you've had for your country, or is it quality jobs that come out of it? And actually, what can we, you know, you're almost a template of what others could do and replicate. Yeah, of course, flexibility is important. And uh, actually, it's one of the issues that we always hear from uh, uh, working women, that we need to have this balance between our work as well as the family and family commitments. But at the same time, it is important that this flexibility would not affect promotion and affect the career path. And I agree with what you, what you said, that uh, whatever interventions are put in laws or policies uh, should not 
favor just women. These interventions, uh, flexibilities should be given to all because at the end of the day, we don't want also the businesses to be overwhelmed with uh, preferential, let's say, treatment to women and to make them at the end of the day prefer not to uh, employ women, for example. And also, uh, we acknowledge the importance and the role of the woman play in the family and in raising the children, which is important. But at the same time, we need to have a business environment that is supportive, that uh, where uh, the female feels comfortable in doing the job, in doing the work, in the career path, as well as being able to have this balance between uh, life and, and, and family and uh, uh, the work. Um, one issue that I would like also to comment on is technology. Technology, I think, is, is really crucial uh, in helping in this, in, in implementing such flexibilities. Um, the pandemic, of course, had its repercussions on, on all economies. Jordan was affected uh, uh, seriously, but at the same time, we've seen some positive uh, let's say, uh, uh, results from the pandemic where we were pushed to use technology and to move to home-based, uh, uh, to working from home, to using technology in different applications. We've seen lots of startups by youth uh, uh, using technology and enabled uh, technology solutions. Um, for a country like Jordan, where transportation, for example, is a challenge uh, that uh, impacts economic participation of women, we see technology as an alternative that helps females to work from home or to work from distant uh, 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 cities or uh, locations uh, and and this this I believe can help in uh, uh, enhancing the participation of women by using technology and this is Lady Jamie also what you're talking about it's basically coding a as an enabler to get more women in the workforce yeah it's not just coding only you know I am the code has now become an end-to-end -end solution for women across the world and you know, I'm talking about women who are marginalized, women who are in Europe, for example, we are looking at women who you know, had their children early. For example, right now, they can't go back to the, to the marketplace. They can't go back to work. Uh, and I think what technology has done at IM Local, what we have done, we built a platform with, to thank, thank to the World Economic Forum. We now have over 35,000 courses that are free. I made sure before we signed the partnership, all the strategic partners, I told them it has to be free because education is very expensive. And then young women and girls growing up across the world in, in, in Brazil, in Senegal, in Kenya, in these refugee camps, unless we change and we shift our mind totally and bring empathy, compassion. That's why when I saw the job, uh, the job skill report, you know, when I saw uh, resilience and, and, and you know, empathy, compassion and kindness, it is our responsibility to really take care of these people. They're not looking for charity, as I said, they're looking for an investment. But we can now use the platform for free. They can go and learn how to code for free. They can learn uh, life skills and soft skills. It's not just coding, but also the mental health of women. During COVID-19, many, many women have been through uh, you know, challenges, personal challenges, and we have not taken care of that. So many companies have given us their self-esteem content, right? Now we have the self-esteem content. We also have the content on climate change issues. Women and violence, domestic violence has increased during COVID-19. So who's talking about this? So now we have women in, uh, you know, women in Arabic countries who can learn how to code, get skills with their hijab in their own home, in their own privacy and dignity. Uh, also immigrants in Europe, right? Like in Sudan, for example, we now work with the Somali community. They came to this country. Now we need to, you know, really support them. I think the point I'm trying to make as a general, uh, if we look into this, the next two to three years, we need to bring empathy, compassion, kindness into the content, but also make things a little bit freer for people who are in need. Because I know that if we invest into young women and girls, the power is so immense because women do grow up. <laughs> I am here because I'm now, I'm 50 years old next year. And so really think about it. So if you invest in a woman now, in 10 years, she will come and sit here next year. <laughs> what do you need? So you've built this amazing ecosystem. What do you need from who now? Is it funding? Is it governments? Or is it private companies that support and then hire? It's a multi-stakeholder approach to the World Economic Forum. So now we, we just need people to have access to it. It's amazing content. Uh, so we work with government, the private sector and investors to really go and give it to people. Like in, you will find out that the Minister of Financing in, in many countries don't understand coding and digital skills are linked to the GDP. You'll find out that the Minister of ICT have digital policies, but they don't have content. You'll find out that minister, the Minister of you know, uh, Education have infrastructure, but they don't have content. So what we're doing now, we're really doing this end-to-end -end solution
in working for UNHCR, UNHCR are custodian of refugees, but they're not practitioners. And I think going practically in helping people, uh, getting strategic partners at WEF to invest, also mentor the girls. You know, we have 350 uh, mentors in companies. When you mentor our girls, you find purpose and meaning. I mean, you are giving one hour a week, two hours a week, to a young, beautiful woman who you never met. There's a reverse mentoring. So at UBS, the, the CEO in Brazil, she's, being, she's working with young women, and they're teaching her something, she's teaching them something. So I think we need to bring a bit. I, I bring humanity in both rooms. <laughs> That's what I do. I love that. Paul, when you look at the economy, and this may be a little bit controversial, but you, you know, there's a very tight labor force. And also there's possibly you know, a recession coming. Does that push women back into the workforce? And, and could that be a change for good? Or is it actually just a disaster waiting to happen? So I think we've got a, we've got a very complicated position. Um, so on some measures, the labor force is very tight. And on some measures, it's just not. I mean, if you look at real wage growth, it's been disastrous for, for two years. So you've got this, this very mixed position. And I think we need to probably... Uh, recognize um, that women contribute in, in a number of ways, as do men. So with things like early retirement, um, people are volunteering, but that's not part of GDP. That's not part of uh, employment in a conventional sense. We're missing out on that sort of stuff. I think that what we want to see is people going into the labor force to have um, constructive uh, careers mm -hmm not to, to be going in out of economic necessity. Because if you right. go in out of economic necessity, effectively you're taking whatever job is available. And that's been one of the things with, with women and commuting. Because stereotypically women are the childcare providers, they don't commute as, as long as men do. That's been a, 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 an objective fact for a number of years. And as a result, women are not taking the job where they can be most productive. They're taking the job that is closest to the school. And that's, I mean, that's just wrong. So now, as we've been talking about with the technology, maybe we start changing that. So again, it's one of these things where if we get a situation where we're getting increased participation rates purely from economic necessity, take whatever job is available because we need the cash, that's not helpful. But I hope that we've actually moved a bit beyond that. It has, to be a, it has to be a skilled based recruitment. We need to, women are so skilled, you know, and in the UK, for example, you know, now we talk about the 50 plus women. Think about it, if you are 50 years old, you probably have 30 years of experience, you know, so we need to hire the women. They have skill, they're smart, they're intelligent, and they know what to do. And so we need to hire them. But at the same time, companies need to not be fearful of the women because they're smart. We need to recruit them so they can make a difference in their company. So I think for me, the, our women, amazing women who are now talking to these young women, it's intergenerational skills now, they're transferring the skills between you know the 50 plus and the young women so i think we need to also think about the yeah. mentorship sue this will be the game changer for women this move away from how we've always recruited hired uh, retained talent moving away from those traditional signals that we've always relied on what school did you go to what degree do you have what job did you did you just do what job did you have four jobs before that we have to move away from that to asking those questions we've always asked and instead ask what is the most important and most basic of question is do you have the skills to do that this job and if we do that, if we make that shift, that is going to be transformational for women. So when we look at the impact on talent pools, when we take this skills first approach, not only do we bring way more women into the talent pool in absolute terms, but crucially and especially we get women into those jobs where they are most uh, underrepresented. In those jobs where women are currently underrepresented, we'd see a 26% relative uplift in female representation versus male. And in addition to that, what we see is it really breaks down those barriers that women face in terms of the well-documented high self-qualification bar that women put in. So on LinkedIn, if you put in front of job seekers the list of skills, if you break down a job description by the list of skills that are required to do that job, you will see a 1.8% 1.8 times 
more women applying for that job than men do. Sometimes it's a skills gap, but sometimes it's a confidence gap and sometimes it's an information gap. And if we can move to this skills-based hiring, we really can make things much, much easier and get women into those roles where they should be and we, where we can benefit most from their participation. So does the LinkedIn algorithm sometimes change that? Because it does, you know, you get offered jobs that maybe you didn't even think to match up. So do you think it helps in actually getting more women in the workforce in, in jobs also that they would not have thought about? There is no question that that happens. And what's extremely powerful is that when you take this skills first approach, when you break down individual jobs into the specific skills that are required to do that job, actually what you realize is there's often an enormous overlap between jobs that are in completely different sectors. And if we can demystify that and make that much more transparent, it's women who are poised to benefit most from it. Paul? Sorry, I think there's a, a really telling anecdote about what happens when you get skills-based recruiting right and what happens when you get it wrong, and it's the same story. So 90, in the war uh, in the UK, we have the code-breaking centre at Bletchley. This is entirely skills-based. Doesn't matter who you are, as long as you can crack a code, you're here. So you have ethnic diversity, you have uh, different nationalities. Um, Alan Turing, the, the lead code breaker, is gay. You have women, women actually working, breaking codes. Mm. And in 1945, the UK led the world in computer technology by at least a decade. Bletchley had been an overwhelming success. UK is years ahead of anybody else in computer technology. By the late 1950s, it's gone entirely. Yep. And it's gone because of a lack of manpower. Manpower being the operative word. Because nearly all of the computer programmers were women. 1945, thank you very much for your service. Please go back to the, the home and, and start washing up. And that lack of, of recognition of skills going from entirely skills-based recruiting because we need to win the war to let's go back to social convention mm -hmm. devastated the industry which has never recovered so it's, it's really really telling how badly wrong you can get this mm -hmm. but how successful you can be when you get it right Maha? Um, I, I agree. Skills is, uh, is the issue now for uh, uh, job uh, seeking. Um, for example, in, in Jordan, uh, when it comes to education, we have around 58% of our university graduates are females. Uh, but when it comes to the economic participation, they don't really get the same opportunities in terms of jobs. So skills is important because you need to do this kind of upskilling and to make sure that our educational system is providing output that matches the demands and the requirements of, of the business, especially with the changes and the developments we're seeing uh, when it comes to technology, AI, etc., and, and the importance of data and all, all these aspects. But another important issue that maybe not everybody is looking at is uh, women also have a special case when compared to, to, to men in the workforce where they may need to withdraw at a certain uh, time because of family, having kids, etc. When, when they come back to the workforce, they need also to be equipped with the needed skills to be able to be accepted in, in the workforce. And um, the other uh, uh, challenge is the skills that are needed not only to enter the, the job or to enter the workforce, but also to be able to have a career path uh, and to be promoted and to be able also to reach uh, decision-making positions. Putting aside, of course, I'm not talking about the other challenges and obstacles, the uh, glass ceiling and, and other aspects that put also an obstacle uh, in front of women when it comes to the career path. I mean, it, I, I, I agree what Paul said. If you look into even black women, you know, even look into the women of color, not just black women, but women of color in America, for example, you know, we have so many women who are talented coders. So now they, they are editing ChatGPT. Our girls in Kakuma refugee camp are editing ChatGPT because women have more empathy when it comes to technology and, and all of that. So they can understand, you know, the feelings. And, and so I think we also need to get women to work and build the solutions they need to build the apps and the websites. So that's what we're trying to do, get them to learn these skills, right? And for me, as I always said, you know, technology has no gender, no age, no race, and we're the one that made it discriminatory. You know, but at the same time, I'm very concerned for, you know, um, many women in Europe and also in Africa who are right now in the middle of their careers, extremely talented, but we are not even having these conversations. That's why the I Am The Code platform has so many users now. Everyone wants to go and learn program management. 
they want to learn Excel. You know, we have some women who don't know how to use Excel. But at the same time, if we allow these people in their own dignity, in their own homes, after the children are in bed, whatever, and, and really skill themselves. And you get certifications, you can code, see the lab. We added a lab inside. We, you, know, you can now code and see the result. And then you can get certifications. In many countries, especially in Arabic countries, certification is dignity. When you have your certification and you go and tell your mom, our girls in Islamabad, when they receive their certifications, they actually frame it, right? And, but also investing in certification, government really need to radically, I think what COVID-19 has, has showed us is that we have let people down. We have the have and the have not, but with coding and technology, we can bring this equilibrium now back and, and put empathy and compassion. It is so imperative. And if you're looking for funding, maybe use the company as your ESG. Right now, many companies are talking about ESGs, but maybe the S of the ESG should be the stamp of humanity, the metrics of humanity, where you can say, I'm investing in this company in 10 years, these women will be this. In five years, these women will be this. And I think until I call the ESGs not to be just a jargon anymore, but to use the S as a stamp of humanity. Thank you. We need to go questions to the floor, but actually indulge me with one final question, Sue and Paul. The, the, so Lady Jami is, is very positive about, you know, chat, I guess technology in general, but one way is also if there's AI, and if at the moment we have 90% programmers that are men, then AI would filter that and the algorithm says, oh, engineers are better suited if they're men. Is, is AI a force for good or actually can it be counterintuitive to women in the workforce? I mean, I think what's crucially important is that we seize this opportunity for women as well. And not only um, to your point, is it really, really important that we are creating opportunities for women to access what will be the jobs of tomorrow. That is fundamentally important for all the reasons that we've just discussed. But frankly, it is just as important that women are involved at the most foundational formative stages of this technology, as you say. We need female voices and female perspectives deciding what technology is developed, how it's deployed, what impact it has, etc. And so for the economic reasons, but also because we know how transformative for society and, economy and economies these technologies are going to be, women have to be there and they have to be there from the get-go. Yeah, Paul, female and all diversity, I guess. Yes, it, it, exactly. I mean, and, and exactly the intersectionality. I mean, that's also important yeah. um, uh, because you know, things like the gender pay gap are quite easy to monitor. But as soon as you move away from that, it becomes a lot more difficult yeah. to monitor. So we need to make sure that no one's left behind, obviously. But um, you know, gender is an important place to start. All right, questions from the floor. And I think there are microphones. Yes, or if you have a very booming voice, you can try and project. No, there's a microphone coming. Hi there, I'm Sonia Shori with Invest Ottawa. I have the privilege of leading our Women Founders and Owners Strategy in Canada's capital with partners across the country. One of the areas we're very focused on is women at the C-suite, particularly all intersections of identity, how we create greater opportunity for wealth, for decision making. Only 5% of CEOs on TSX listed companies are women, only 7% are chairs, and something like 18% are on board seats. They're dismal numbers that we're working hard to change. I'd value any insight and lessons learned, data-driven opportunities that we could be pursuing. Uh, yeah, so you're absolutely right. Um, it is not an encouraging picture when it comes to leadership. And, and as we were discussing, we've seen some of the progress that we have been making go backwards. So today on LinkedIn, less than a third of women are in leadership roles. Just 32% of women are in leadership positions. And that number has barely budged in the past seven years. It's gone up a measly 1% since 2016. So we have a ton of work to do if we're going to move the numbers that you cited and the numbers that we see day in, day out on our platform. And there are a couple of key areas where we need to focus. The data points us very clearly to where these interventions need to happen. The first is getting into that first manager role. And the second is getting promoted internally. So when it comes to getting that first manager role, you can almost think of that as the first rung on the leadership level. There we already have a gap. There we already have a problem where we see a 9% drop off for women versus men. 
First problem. Then when it comes to internal promotion, globally, men are 33% more likely to get an internal promotion versus women. And you can see so clearly how from those early stages of a woman's career, those problems compound and that gap grows. So when you zoom right back, when we look at LinkedIn, you go on LinkedIn today, at entry level, we've about 50% women. At manager level, we're down to about a third. And by the time you get into the boardroom, you're down to 25%. So we're going from a half to a third to a quarter by the time we are at that C-suite level that you mentioned. And we have got to start targeting the interventions way before the boardroom, right back at that pre-manager level, and then right throughout the, the life cycle of, of women's careers as well. Yes, we have a question here on the right in the middle, and then on the second row. Hi, I'm Magdalena Skipper, Editor-in-Chief of Nature, um, and the last question actually sets up, sets up my question very well and ties in with something that you discussed, namely the flexibility for working from home. There was a very tantalizing article in the New York Times recently based on a white paper, based on some research, saying that the very demographic uh, that wants the most flexibility in terms of working, so women and other un underrepresented groups, is exactly the demographic that would most benefit from being in the office to create the networks that are then required for promotion and advancement. How do we square this circle to offer the flexibility that those groups want and yet create an opportunity for them to progress, which of course they and we also want? And Paul, you touched on this, which is also almost, you suggested mandatory staying from home for everyone, right? So, uh I, th I think you need flexible working across the board. You can't, because if you say, well, you, you work flexible and that's a special privilege, then you're almost automatically starting to exclude those people. I have to say I'm quite sceptical about um, the face-to-face -face, um, networking being important all the time. I think it is important but not necessarily all the time. I mean, I work in a global organization. You know, there are members of my team I ha still haven't seen since the pandemic in person just because they're on the other side of the world and you know, I've got other things to do. Um, so I think that you know, as we get more global companies and, and, and so on, teams that are global aren't necessarily coming together all the time and that doesn't necessarily damage careers. I mean, it, it didn't damage my career that you know, half the time my boss is in a different country or a, a different continent. And I think um, the, the other thing that we, we need to be thinking about is you know, the, there's this idea that the younger generation are suffering because they're not getting th this sort of flexibility. But if you look at the UK data, uh, where the Office of National Statistics is quite good in providing the breakdown, younger people are just as keen to have flexible working as their older peers. It's not those of us in our 50s you know, who are you know, wanting to spend more time at home because we know everybody and we don't care. The younger generation also want that flexibility, but it doesn't mean 100% of the time. It means uh, uh, just more flexibility coming through. And again, when we come back to intersectionality, I think it's important to recognize that um, whilst an extrovert person may build a network in the office, an introverted person does not. Mm. You know, if you're a naturally shy and retiring person like myself, you tend not to, to go out and, and build the network in person, but actually remotely you may be a lot better at doing that. So I think we, we need to be a little bit careful. I think there's some selection bias in how we view this. I just wanted to add on that, and I think what LinkedIn is, does very well is that you know, when you are a woman you know, in, in different places of the world, you may not have access to LinkedIn, but LinkedIn actually uh, now is giving women to get visibility, right? So they're training them. There are so many videos out there to help you be, you know, for, to get a flexible job, people need to actually see you as well. Right? So you need to also apply where companies are giving you flexibility. So they are really good at giving you, uh, you know, this training to make your profile beautiful and to learn so many things on LinkedIn. Our girls are using LinkedIn right now to update their profiles, right? Because I know in the next two years, someone will go and find them within LinkedIn. It's not very huge, their profiles, but they, can, they now have access to LinkedIn. So I think we also need to come forward and improve our visibility and work with companies that can actually give us flexibility.
Yeah, I mean, I haven't read the article, but I did hear, and I have a lot of sympathy for a lot of people, that, especially female chief executives, that worry if all the men go back to the office five times a week and the women stay back, then in three, four years they may get less promotions. So maybe it's something that longer term you need to think about. And if I might add uh, that flexibility is important, but if, is to be made, if it is to be made compulsory, it should be made compulsory for all, not only for women, so regardless of gender. Uh, but what we have in Jordan, for example, it's, it's, on, it's, a, it's an option. So it's not compulsory uh, for the employees to work from home in certain days. It's an option. Whoever requires or needs to work from home with the consent of the supervisor, then this is allowed. Um, I believe this provides, you know, this, it has pros, pro, pros and cons, but it may have more pros than cons, uh, because you, usually when it's an option, whoever requires to take it, whether it's a woman or a, or a man, it's available. Uh, it shouldn't affect also their career path and uh, being present in office and having this uh, networking option. Great, we have a question on the second row. And then can I see a quick show of hands? Because we only have a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, my name is uh, Sana Khasawne. I'm from Jordan Business and Professional Women Association CEO. And we are the implementing national uh, coordinator for uh, the accelerator, the gender parity accelerator in Jordan. Um, my question is more about um, kind of a disruptive, I would say, uh, innovation. Of I feel that for the past um, 20 years, we've been too slow in being innovative in our approach to tackle the leadership and how can we ensure gender parity across. We've been going into the same pace and not being disruptive enough. I'm a VUCA, uh, I like Vitality Uncertainty module, which really tackles how can we really be innovative in the way that we're as, uh, anticipating the future and looking into from a different angle. For example, as you mentioned about AI and how we are recruiting and how are we educating or actually looking into the uh, AI to be gender sensitive. Um, if we look into the flexible working hours, and thank you, uh, Your Excellency, for mentioning flexibility should not be only for women. It has to be across, it's a gender mainstreaming. So how can we first change the narrative of our approach from asking for it rather than it's an earned right that we need to bring to the table. Uh, secondly, the future of work is no longer the same, especially after Corona or COVID-19. So there has to be a change in the workplace as modality, as policies, as um, uh, approach, uh, even as strategies. And I don't think we're moving enough to that direction. Thirdly is around the uh, digital transformation. It's a huge expense at all levels, especially for the private sector. How can we, as uh, and we are in, in a place where it can be actually um, supported in a different direction. Sorry, too many maybe thoughts, but I wanted no. just to bring it from a different angle, if possible. Yeah, very interesting. I'm going to just take two other questions, because we're tight for time, and then we'll kind of try and answer everything at, at once. All right, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Monda Piri. I wanted to, well, I wanted to start by saying uh, some of the happiest countries in the world, right, are led by women, so that says a lot. And um, the distribution of dynamics being greater when women are empowered cannot be overemphasized, so that's really fantastic. What I wanted to ask is, especially the program that you are, are running, does it focus on sort of um, inculcating that desire to want to lead? There was a study which for the life of me, I cannot remember, but it was done in the US where when you ask um, boys and girls, you find that fewer girls, if any, will actually say they would like to lead at some point. So women lack this conviction to sort of put themselves forward. So is that something you, you look into? And then just to provoke the debate a little bit, for women who want to stay at home, where are we on compensating, uh, compensating them for you know their um, their, their work at home, right? Unpaid labor, it still goes on. So how do we sort of meet both fronts? Thank you. Great, thank you. And then a final question, I think here. Yeah. And then so we have questions on visionary all in like three minutes. <laughs> There's a lot to get through. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, uh, I'm the CEO of the US Center for Advanced Manufacturing, so male dominant area across all industries. And we have an all female led um, executive team. And often we get the comment, how does that work? Um, and it's an interesting comment, and normally my CEO says, because we've made the environment for it to happen. So my question is, you know, we talk a lot about what women need to do to get there and break all the, these walls, but what about the accountability of the environment in which we're supposed to thrive in? 
big big questions. Who wants to start? No. So do you want to? Or, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I can yeah. definitely start. I think you are like like I said earlier. We need to make the environment friendly for women. 100%, you know, and uh, to answer your question, our girls are so powerful. <laughs> they are so powerful young women, and so they're not looking for permission at all. So they want to lead. So remember, these girls are refugees, you know, mainly our girls are from the men, they're not part of the mainstream. Um, first of all, they are resilient. They have a determination and motivation to succeed. They're hustlers. And, and that's why when they are coding, they know they're going to lead. They want to go and lead their countries. Our girls in Kakuma, the South Sudanese, the Burundi, the, the DRC, they want to go back home and lead. I mean, I, I was saying to a, a lady journalist the other day, if you want to really design a female curriculum, female leadership curriculum, I invite you to come to Kakuma Refugee Camp to meet Betty. She is a curriculum of female leadership. Any, uh, Sue, do you want to mention on, I, I, well, you can take either on visionaries or leadership? Or? Um, I, I would say um, the scenario that you set out is, is very much the exception, right? Usually we see the obverse, which is even where we have female dominated industries, right? Where education is a good example. At entry level, we have 60% women. By the time we get to our leadership, we're at 35%, right? So the, the normal circumstance that we see is that women, that tapering off that we see very dramatically is happening throughout industries and where it isn't happening where we see successes again is where there's that real intentionality on hiring practices on how workplaces are set up and again how we are helping both men and women shoulder those caregiving responsibilities we're going to have to be very intentional about each of those three areas if we're going to move the needles in the other direction we only have one minute left paul do you want 30 seconds then maha you can so uh, one note of optimism i think on on how do we get to a, a better environment a better uh, way forward and uh, that is by providing role models in an unusual way or a slightly unusual way the cultural value of uh, role models so who we see in television programs who we follow on media and there i think we are seeing some changes particularly with the younger generation over social media things like netflix youtube videos and so on there are young leaders um, in a way that my generation doesn't understand but gen z changes the world one TikTok dance at a time <laughs> yes do i um, follow that <laughs> i will try um, um i think we need to focus on the private sector uh, when we compare with the government, the public sector, the political participation of women, we see, I think, more success when compared to the business uh, community. And this has much to do with the culture in the business. Uh, and in order to change this culture, we need to have uh, not only to change the culture and to role models is very important and to see these successful examples as the lady who just uh, mentioned in the manufacturing sector, a non-traditional sector for uh, females to lead in. Uh, we need also to focus on gender mainstreaming in an institutional level in, in the business, uh, in businesses. Well, thank you all so much for a wonderful panel and thank you for the questions. That's it.